Hello and welcome to the Unnamed Reverse Engineering Podcast. I'm Avro, and with me today is my co-host Jen. Hi. And Let's our keep guest... the energy up, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and our guest today is uh, Thomas Roth, aka Stack Smashing. Welcome to the show, Thomas. Welcome. Hello, thank you. That was awesome the least giggliest we've done in a while. <laughs> you know, we we try, we try. We try. Um, welcome, welcome. <laughs> Yeah, we're super excited. We 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 talked to Yuska in the past, um, and I know uh, you kind of worked there on some projects, and and I'm glad you're able to join us. No, glad to be here. Yeah, I I listened to this podcast, so it was great to get invited to it. <laughs> oh yeah, we're we're, we're, we're so we're happy sorry. to have you. We're sorry it took so long. <laughs> yes, yeah, we've been <laughs> we've been a little uh, off uh, the past three months, but we just took a break and we're back and back to our normal schedule of every so many weeks <laughs> yeah don't be precise or anything nope no commitments nope. there so yeah can you uh tell us a little bit about yourself uh before we get started just uh, introduce to everyone else sure yeah um my name is thomas i'm probably better known as stack smashing by now um i'm a security researcher i do a lot of you know low level firmware stuff a lot of hardware stuff a ton of fault injection, uh, more precisely on the hardware side. And yeah, I've been playing around with, with a ton of different things. I have a small YouTube channel where I you know, show some of that, um, some of my more fun projects, let's say, and uh, look a bit into hacking hardware and you know, hacking air tags or you know, random Nintendo stuff and so on. So how, how did you get started in reverse engineering? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I saw it in the show notes and I was wondering myself. And to be honest, I'm not even <laughs> entirely sure. <laughs> um, I don't know. For me, I've always loved to play with hardware. Like even in, in school, I was like in this Lego robotics club, basically. And oh, we like yes. won a couple of competitions. And I always loved this this combination of like firmware and hardware, like this this part where software touches the real world kind of and, and vice versa. You know, if you look at, at hacking hardware, and I remember doing things like, you know, installing Linux on my um, click wheel iPod, uh, stuff like that. And so it's always been kind of, kind of, I've, I always, I've always been a hardware person, I guess. Like in school, I remember like soldering an LPT programming adapter for AVR programming and so mm -hmm. on back mm -hmm. when there wasn't Arduino yet. Um, and yeah, all that, that kind of stuff. I also had like this Palm M100 PA and there was this book that taught you how to do like how to write software that can talk to electronics via the the docking port on it. Uh -huh. And so all that kind of stuff. And then I got, I was always curious about security and then somehow ended up in security. And so, yeah, um, combining hardware and firmware and security kind of led to, you know, reverse engineering. It uh, was kind of a natural progression, to be honest, somehow. Yeah. So living the dream, it sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> Somewhat. Uh, spending a ton of time staring into disassembly, if that counts as living the dream, then absolutely. <laughs> I mean, for some people, I think I think that's that's what they want. But let's go back for a second, because you mentioned, the, was it the Palm 100 that you yeah, said? Yeah, Palm M100. Yeah, exactly, so yeah. so um, do you know Dimitri Grinberg at all? Because he's way into the Palm stuff. I, I know him from the show and like from from the internet, so to say, but uh, yeah, I yeah. don't know him personally. Um, He also... Uh, for a long, long time, that that's kind of his baby, if I remember correctly, is reverse engineering Palm 100s, and I think he actually, if I think he actually has some rights over some portion of the code or the naming or something like that. That should definitely be something we should we should get you guys talking. Oh, that's amazing! <laughs> if yeah. you still wanna, if you still have some palms lying around and want to play with us, yeah, the, I guess my my, you know handheld of choice is definitely the game boy as you can probably tell by yeah, some of I my saw, projects I, I don't know i, I like being being a child and playing on the on the game boy and then imagining oh it would be so cool if i could write my own stuff for it and mm -hmm. you know now now i actually can and so that's that's pretty cool i i'm yeah. pretty sure my my eight-year-old me would be pretty impressed <laughs> was there I, so i didn't get a chance to look at those videos but I mean, I definitely saw that you have the the one video where you're trying to in, in, in enable multiplayer. Maybe we could talk about that later because I'm really interested to hear about that because I kind of love that stuff. Sure. Um, but uh, we we were starting off um, because you had worked with Jessica on uh, the AirTags. Why don't you talk a little bit about that project? 
Sure, yeah. So I guess for those who don't know, I guess I was the first one to publicly uh, dump the firmware of the Apple AirTags, which was kind of weird because, to be honest, when the Apple AirTags launched, I had like zero interest in them because, you know, it's a key finder. <laughs> what, what could yeah. it probably Big be? Big deal, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then I, I woke up and I, I had this email <laughs> with like a flash dump of the AirTags in my, in my uh, inbox, basically. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and somebody knew exactly what they were doing and just fully nerd sniped me with that and like i saw oh there's some arm code on there then i saw colin o'flynn's pictures who's uh -huh. a good friend of mine yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, and i saw oh it's an nif i've glitched nif before like i can probably i can dump this thing and so like when when an apple product releases it's always like kind of a race almost right like who manages oh, to some, somewhat hack it first and like you know, that, that kind of nerd sniped me. And so I, I got an appointment at the Apple store, bought like uh, four AirTags, immediately bricked one with like the first one I tried to open, I immediately broke it. And then I <laughs> uh, I got lucky. Like I, I think there's the whole Twitter thread where you can kind of follow along. Uh, yep. I used like fault injection to, to dump the, the yeah. firmware of it, which was um, which was really fun. And then it's like this this check mark in my in the CV in my head to be the first one uh, to to hack a certain Apple product, even if it's just a key finder. It, it was it was fun I'll, to I'll follow along <laughs> live yeah, for sure. Yeah. I was I was there uh, as a spectator. Yeah, I, I I I've been really surprised by how accessible that product is because usually Apple products aren't that accessible. But I give I guess the size, like the complexity and size, is what makes it more hackable. Yeah. Um, do, you know, one thing that I wasn't clear on, d did we ever figure out what ultra wideband chip they were using? Was it um yeah, it's probably custom. one? It's like yeah, it's a custom it's a custom um ultra wideband chip. Yeah, um there's there's some <laughs> there's a couple very of them. similar <laughs> yes. on the market, let's say, but yeah, um it's it's custom by Apple. Like if you uh if you open it up, which is also one of the uh, let's say cooler things about the attack, right? Like mm -hmm. you have the so far, if you wanted to do ultra wideband research with like Apple devices, you had to buy like this 800 euro or whatever iPhone. Yeah. And now you could get these these key finders which have a U1 in them, and uh, you can do some cool experiments. And there's also, I think there are also a lot of privacy implications with this overall Find My network and so on, which were pretty pretty interesting to look at. Yeah, as someone who was researching ultra wideband applications at another company <laughs> yes <laughs> the the problem is the battery <laughs> yeah okay so so yeah so going back like uh looking at your video i i was really i was very much in awe in the clarity of your video particularly around how you set up how you were glitching it and and automated that talk a little bit about that yeah sure so um i guess so maybe about fault injection itself briefly. So so yeah. basically fault injection is like this this technique where you try to introduce, as the name suggests, faults in the chip, and that can, you know, lead to to memory reads being corrupted, or you can even skip instructions. And there are a ton of ways to do that. Like you can, you know, fiddle with the clock signal that clocks the CPU, or you can just uh, tie the power to, of the chip to ground for like a very short amount of time, and so then the chip doesn't have enough power to do you know its current instruction or so and so maybe maybe the the data read that the read from ram gets corrupted or maybe you can skip an instruction and so on and that's what we kind of used for the the microcontroller on the on the attack so in the attack you have an nrf microcontroller and when it when you when you provision it in the factory, you try to lock down the debug interface, right? Like you don't want you know Tom, Thomas to come and dump the firmware, <laughs> and so you you lock it down. And so um, what's though? However, for the NIF, there's a known vulnerability in the boot ROM of the chip, and so limited results, uh, I think, found this this vulnerability where when you cut the power to the chip for a super short amount of time during the mm -hmm. boot of the device you re-enable the debug interface. And that's what kind of what we did on the attack. So basically we, we searched for the core um, voltage supply of the microcontroller. And then we resetted the chip and cut the power for a very short amount of time, like a couple of, of nanoseconds. Okay. And that re-enabled kind of um, JTAG, which allowed us to just, you know, use, use a regular JTAG adapter to dump the firmware. So a couple of nanoseconds, but it had to, it had to be at zero or below like that 
that critical threshold for like I, I basically just used a random MOSFET to just pull it yeah. to ground like just um, yeah it was actually kind of funny because I was um, I was in the process of like normally you would use an FPGA or something with very precise timing yeah. Yeah, but yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I kind of have this this kind of running gag where I try to hack everything with like the Raspberry Pi Pico and so yeah. I thought it would be <laughs> really fun to look, use like the $5 microcontroller instead of the $100 FPGA yep and so um the the Raspberry Pi Pico has this this thing called PIO where you can do super precise timing mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and and I wanted to build like the glitcher which basically waits for the chip to boot up waits like a very precise amount of time and then glitches the chip via a MOSFET mm -hmm. I wanted to write that using this PIO thing, but then I, like, while I was writing the PIO, I thought, well, I can also just try a for loop while I'm programming the other stuff. And so um, while I was preparing this super precise glitch, it already worked with, like, just a random for loop that would increase the delay and, yeah, yeah so kind of yeah, got super I, lucky. Yeah, I saw, like, as you were writing that, I'm like, I wonder how he's going to, like, deal with the variation, like, and and possible capacitance dissipating on that like as the voltage drops i was like kind of like how are we controlling for that i'm like oh he's just gonna like we'll just try everything and see what happens yeah <laughs> the good news is like the chip boots in like a millisecond or so yeah. and like you you just have to reset the chip um wait a couple of you know nanoseconds or microseconds glitch it and then see if jtag is enabled and you can do this you know i don't know like 20 times per second or so and so that was really like i just wrote a python script that Ask the Raspberry Pi, please reboot the the AirTag, then try to connect via JTAG. And yeah, um, no no advanced science there, just a <laughs> MOSFET and a lot of luck, basically. Yeah, I think the the chip shouter or the chip chip whisperer also have uh, these features, right? For for the precise timing of of these events. Yeah, the the chip shouter uh, and the chip whisperer, they sorry, only the chip whisperer, I guess, uses an FPGA to like do super precise timing, which absolutely makes sense. Um, but it turns out that on the NIF, it's just it boots so slow, and you can just glitch it with with whatever. Like I'm surprised that nobody has done it with a paperclip, almost. <laughs> you mean just like short, 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 yeah, short, just <laughs> eventually you will get lucky. You'll so. get it, yeah. Yeah, no, I've I've been following a couple other like glitching examples. I mean, I know Joe Grant, a past guest of the show, was was doing it for getting into um, crypto wallets. Which, which um, yeah. I've been looking at some STM eight projects. The crypto wallet stuff was was based on on research we did, right? Like it was like based on on wallet fail, which is what, oh nice what we did a couple of years ago. So this that was kind of one of our fault injection vulnerabilities. Okay. I did not know that you also worked on wallet nice. fail. <laughs> Yeah, I'm. I'm like. Yeah, I'm part of what. <laughs> cool. I'll add it to the show notes. Yes, get that in <laughs> there. Awesome. Get that in there because I. I mean, I have. I. I. I at the Mountain View Reverse Engineering Meetup, I did get one of those crypto wallets, and I still have yet to like. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's play a with that a bit. To, to glitch, basically. Yeah, yeah. It's it's kind of funny because because I think like fault injection used to be the super elite thing, kind of. Um, because everyone. At least I thought before I did it the first time, I thought it was like super Hard. difficult to do. But it's just, you know, build a for loop, preferably on an FPGA to avoid, you know, all the, the timing issues. Um, but yeah. then, or you, you use a Raspberry Pi Pico and just, just glitch it. And I think like Leonard um, also glitched like the Starling mm -hmm. terminal with the Raspberry yeah, Pi Pico. That's right. And yep. so I, I love it. I really like that people are now doing this for like $6 instead of $200. Or way more, depending on how fancy yeah. you want to get. Yeah, yeah. I, I feel like that's that's the overall market is like the tools are getting so cheap and accessible. Like, I, like yeah, after the, watching some of your videos, I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> but the Silicon <laughs> vendors can't update nearly fast enough, right? Like, as, the NR52 yeah. is going to have that uh, bug for forever, right? It, 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 you know, yeah. It's uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's popular. Great. Yeah, it's super. <laughs> well, I think the time so. So in kind of in summary, like if you were looking at like some of the, a lot of like the microcontrollers, like the, you know, Cortex M0 series or in the family, they're probably running so slow because their focus is on power that that glitching of them is they're just going to be super susceptible to that. It sounds like. Yeah, exactly. But also the, the faster ones are all like pretty glitchable just because there's no countermeasure in, in the chip. And like if you. Like some people think that the brownout detector in the chip might be enough to catch a glitch, but it's not because the brownout no. detector is like for much slower power events and so on. And yeah. so 
Okay. Yeah, it's, it's really, there, there are no, I'm not familiar with any like regular microcontroller that you can get without NDA that actually has like glitch monitors and so on. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess to, to you can only mitigate, like you can add random delays before you do checks and stuff, and, and then it just makes it harder, but not impossible to to actually yeah. glitch it, I guess. And then if it's in the boot ROM, it's like, what are yep. you going to do, right? You're screwed. It's game over. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Um, have, have you worked on uh, the, the AirTag stuff since, or was that a kind of like, all right, I, 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 I dumped the firmware, let's let the community take over? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Kind of. So, so basically, after I glitched it, I also thought, hey, um, let's make a, a DEF CON talk out of this. And so I did some more experiments. Like the, the AirTag has this uh, accelerometer integrated. And so I tried to use that as like a, a shitty microphone, basically. And, oh, wow. Um, like and a, the... like a, kind of a replacement voice accelerometer in some sense? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So like basically trying to measure the vibration. And I, I, I literally put like the AirTag into the bottom of a Pringles can to make it a better resonator, Amplified? basically. Yeah. And so... Uh, it didn't really work well, to be honest, but we, we had some fun with like replacing, you know, the, the sound the attack makes with the rickroll and stuff like yeah. that. <laughs> and that was at, at DEF CON. And then afterwards, actually, like Yiska and um, also uh, Fabian uh, and me, we gave a talk at Hardware.io where we like, you know, talked about the glitching, but then also they went far deeper in reverse engineering it. And I know some people are doing some other cool stuff with the attacks at the moment. So, yeah. I think like for me, after glitching it, for me, it was kind of, you know, check mark done, but yeah. I, some other people did some really cool stuff there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. That's awesome. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to trying this uh, in the near future. <laughs> did, you get, did you get, thing. did you get a bunch for yourself or? No, I have, I have a, I have a consulting project that I need to glitch. So. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, really so much fun. It's so so good, like especially with the with like, if you do it on the cheap, it's, yeah, it's just I don't no. Know. I I started using the the RP twenty forty for for a different project, mm -hmm. and it yeah, I, I was I, I did I use MicroPython, but then you can still use the PIOs with all their benefits, and I was able to get some crazy timing. And a few lines of Python, and I was just like, this does not like what this shouldn't be working. I'm using Python. Yep. <laughs> So so yeah yeah it's it's uh, yeah Python has become way more useful <laughs> day to day and and for this stuff much more so than I ever expected. Uh, okay, right. let, let's let's move on to the other fun well, project. Well, yes, you you also tackled another reasonably cheap Apple product. I believe they call <laughs> it the Apple Cable, the Lightning Cable. <laughs> yeah, so. So somewhat. So so basically, um, there's this thing called the the Cansi cable, which is this this mythical cable that is that you can use to get JTAG on on the iPhone, which is you know um, a pretty cool thing to do. At least as a hardware hacker, like getting JTAG on the iPhone sounds sounds like a fun project. And like the the issue is that the Cansi cables, like you can get them on like the I guess the black market or very dark gray market. Um, and I've never actually seen one one myself, in a, like physically, and it basically allowed you to to get JTAG on on certain engineering iPhones. But then with with the Checkmate exploits, which was like a boot ROM exploit on iPhone seven, iPhone eight, and iPhone X, you could actually like re-enable JTAG on production iPhones. But you needed this this Cansi cable to actually get JTAG. But it's you know very difficult to get. And then if you do you know serious research at a university or so. You can't really buy the cable on the black market. Uh, they don't give you an invoice yeah. that the university will accept. <laughs> <laughs> um, or, but there's also yeah. like the commercial cable called Bonobo cable. Um, mm -hmm. But unfortunately, it's it's not in stock since like years, basically. And I I have a lot of friends who who are into iPhone research, like you know Yiska Yiska Klassen and and others. And mm -hmm. yeah, we basically uh, we were talking. I was like, hey, I. I know the Lightning protocol. I've looked at it years ago. I know JTAG. So, I mean, there can't be so much missing. <laughs> How hard um, can it be? Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, hundreds of hours later. <laughs> uh, that's that's like nothing, right? Yeah. yeah it, it, you did it, sleep and eat in between, right? I tried oh, to. <laughs> I tried to, yeah. Didn't um, Apple have a uh, more recently do a program for you know very specific uh researchers to actually provide these tools 
I think they provide you with like an iPhone that is like the uh, Apple Research Device uh, program or so it's called, and it's they give you like an iPhone with you know that you don't have to jailbreak uh, and so on. But I don't think it gives you JTAG. I don't know if they provide you with oh. like a JTAG cable. Maybe it just has other other uh, debug features, perhaps. Yeah, exactly. And so and so the the thing with Lightning is like the Lightning port on the bottom of the iPhone. It's it's not. Like when you plug in an I a lightning cable into an iPhone, it's not just like you know a passive cable. There's like a, a microcontroller in the plug that you plug in, and then the iPhone talks to the chip in the cable, and they're like, "Hey, who are you? What's your serial number? What's your length?" and and all that kind of stuff. And so and and yeah, that's it's kind of crazy how complex it is. Yeah. So I, it, you know, Alvaro and I were discussing this earlier because you know naturally my first inclination is like, is this I call it MFI, Alvaro calls it MFI. Is that basically like kind of a similar protocol, what they're using there? Like their old school, like what they used to have on that really- Made for iPhone, yeah. Yeah, made for iPhone so protocol. To be, I, I've not looked at MFI, uh, to be honest, but I've, you know, I've, I've looked ex extensively now, now at Lightning and basically when you like plug in a Lightning cable, you there's this, this protocol called ID bus or SDQ which kind of authenticates the the accessories. And so I talked to some people that sent me direct messages and they said it's similar to the MFI stuff, but I I can't confirm it myself having mm -hmm. I haven't worked on any, you know, MFI uh, so, stuff. So 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 yeah, you, you have I don't know if it was a video or, or a presentation, but it's it's the one wire protocol, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's like the same protocol as as OneWire. And I I did like a video, I did kind of the DEF CON talk about the whole JTAG thing and then a video dedicated about the basics of Lightning, and so it's it's basically this this one wire protocol that you also use to like talk to temperature sensors and so on, just much 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 faster. Like I yeah. think they they really tune it up so that it's you know more difficult to emulate on like a microcontroller. But yeah, yeah. luckily we have this nice microcontroller now with very high speed features. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean I I will. Like just kind of a side note, I do think the MFI. A lot of those documents are publicly available. I don't think that they hide them. I, I think it's just anymore. the <laughs> if you're a uh, certified a made for iPhone product, you, Apple gives you this uh, authentication chip, and you have to put it on your product. They only give you ten until you officially give. Like it used to be, they give you ten, which is what like for blue, if you were doing Bluetooth or a wired thing, then you would you would need the chips. But if you um but if you're doing BLE, you didn't, which is why they were pushing people to BLE for a long time. Yeah, so so minor sidetrack on this for uh, for another project. Sorry. Uh, I wanted to do well for for a while if you had a, a joystick or anything that would plug in, you would also need that and otherwise it wouldn't work. Mm -hmm. But they had an exception for the PlayStation 4 controllers and PlayStation 5. So uh -huh. I I wanted to do a Arduino to um iPad controller, and then I just had to clone the PlayStation 4 profile, and then the iPad was like, "Oh yeah, you're cool." Uh, so yep. so th there's there's that ways around right. it. Yeah. yeah, that that's kind of how 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 we did it. Like I was, I think at at Yiska's place, and so we we uh, we were just talking. And like at 4 a.m., I like got the logic analyzer out of my back. I was like, so I I came prepared. I've got this, you know. It took till 4 a.m. for you to take out the logic analyzer. That wasn't like a midnight thing, 4 a.m. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, 4 a.m. I, I think there's this, I, I checked because I have a photo of like the desk and the, the timestamp was like 4 a.m. I was like, oh God, what were we doing? <laughs> um, but yeah, we, we basically then then sniffed like the regular lightning um, mm -hmm. lightning traffic. And then we yeah. also, there's this, this cable called Alex cable or DCSD cable. Which mm -hmm. is like this this cable that you can plug into your iPhone and it gives mm -hmm. you this the bootlock via UART on your mm -hmm. computer. So it's like a a lightning to UART adapter, and so we sniffed that. And then um, I went home and kind of built this on a Raspberry Pi Pico and started talking to the iPhone and kind of had this this basic lightning communication uh, ongoing. Um, but then was was kind of a long a long way to actually get JTAG um, on the iPhone, which was uh, much more involved than I actually thought. Like I thought this was you know as you typically start a project. Did you have to fuzz it or did the Bonobo uh, have documentation on which commands to send? Yes, yeah, so so this was, so basically there's a lot of information out there on Lightning. There's just no open source tooling for it. It was really weird because you you talk to a lot of people and you, you go online in like discords and stuff and everyone is like, yeah, I built something, but I keep it secret and so on. And so 
a lot of people I talked to were like, yeah, you know, next year or so I will release X, Y, Z and it's, it's still not out there. And so um, there's, for example, there's this, this page which describes which bits you have to, to reply to the iPhone to get into like um, JTAG or actually SWD mode on the lightning port. And so I thought like, hey, easy. I, you know, I just, I wait for the request from the iPhone. I reply, hey, do JTAG. And then I, I do JTAG. That's it, right? <laughs> easy. Um, and luckily the, the Bonobo cable actually has like open uh, source, open OCD configs. And so I was oh, like, cool. hey, yeah, this yeah, will yeah, take yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. two hours tops, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> but then it 99 just, hours later <laughs> yeah exactly. it just didn't work like i i you know i i implemented the the one wire protocol i got it into swd but then it would just not um enumerate and we didn't have any trace of like a working bonobo cable of a working can cable like this was completely clean room so to say so so all i had was like this documentation on github on what bits to send in theory mm -hmm. like to get into swd yeah yeah um, but then, you know, I could read the ID register from the iPhone, which meant like, okay, something was working. This was somewhat correct, but I just couldn't get it to debug. And then um, then basically I started, like this took hours, right? I was, I was double checking what's going on. And then I saw that my, that OpenOCD doesn't handle the, the weight response that SWD supports at all. Like it just ignores it and continues, you know, bit banging, like who needs that anyway? So I implemented my own SWD stack um, to handle <laughs> that on the Raspberry Pi Pico. Uh, and then I, you know, it still wouldn't work. And then I, yeah. I built like a fuzzer. I just built a fuzzer that would flip bits on the SWD commands to hopefully eventually get a successful, you know, get, get a core to halt. Yeah. And that took, that took a lot of hours but you know when you're when you feel like you're so close to the goal it's very difficult to stop and so yeah so i i think given given that you had talked to other people and they said yeah, yeah i have something but they didn't, they weren't sharing it publicly and then you spending so much time do you feel like you kind of understand why they weren't sharing it or do you think that there was no. something else at play like they just don't want to be sued it's by just cruel apple? no I, yeah. I think they don't want to be sued by <laughs> apple I think there's this kind of this thing where where people don't want to publish unfinished mm. things. It's very Just, PhD um, of them. <laughs> yeah, I I don't have any qualms about publishing unfinished code. So <laughs> to be honest, no, but but like yeah, yeah. Now, now you're basically saving time to everyone else that's going through this, right? Yeah, it's um, also like you know if you want to do low level iPhone security research, you have to have these JTAG capabilities, right? And it also like. It now supports, you know, automatically resetting the iPhone into DFU. So even if, if you want to do like certain fuzzing things, uh, I know that, you know, the, the Frida, Ole is using it at Frida. I know of others yeah. like Linus Hensel is using it now. He even patched it. So it turns out my my first release was indeed uh, maybe a bit broken uh, as it happens. Um, but yeah, in the end, like for it to, to regularly talk like JTAG to the iPhone, a single bit was missing in my communication. Like literally <laughs> just a single bit was was wrong. And so, yeah, um, luckily the, the fuzzer found that, but that was kind of, yeah. But now, you know, people can use Raspberry Pi Pico mm -hmm. and, and build their own, you know, Kansi cable or Bonobo cable. We call it the Tamarind cable because, you mm -hmm. know, all these cables are named after, after monkeys or apes. And so we use the one with the best uh, mustache. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like the, I like the image. <laughs> Yeah, if you, if you look at photos, <laughs> if you look at photos of all the other ones, they have mm -hmm. engraved um, apes. Oh, the, yeah, the, like, well, that, I guess that's better than me buying a useless picture of an ape. <laughs> <laughs> this, this cable does something. <laughs> These are more rare, um, <laughs> probably. <laughs> so I guess l l l let's step back really quick. We, we we've thrown a lot of words around, but yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So we uh, there is JTAG. Um, um, we've we've had an episode on JTAG. SWD is single wire debug is just a serialized version of that, right? But specific to ARM. Yes. Yeah. Just want to make sure people aren't trying to do that with their app mail, whatever. What what's involved in implementing your own SWD stack? Is is this um, what, what kind of command? What do you have to implement? It's it's pretty straightforward, really, because it's like it's kind of like you know I squared C. You have like a clock signal and then um, a bidirectional data line, and so mm -hmm. doing SWD is surprisingly easy. There's like this 600 page uh, document from ARM that you read so you know, two to three times, and then you you understand <laughs> half of it, and then. 
you just start implementing it and I just compared so so that was actually I, I compared it between you know what I saw in the logic analyzer mm -hmm. and then it didn't make sense and it turns out that my uh, that the the SWD plugin of the logic analyzer was actually broken and didn't handle SWD correctly and so step one was patching the SWD analyzer for Salier or however you pronounce yeah, yeah Salier yeah yeah Salier. Salier. um I think so first of all is there an audiobook version of that manual <laughs> <laughs> I suggested that on Twitter at the time. I was like, why is one zero, nobody reading this? What you'll see is 10010 <laughs> on the screen. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, it's a lot more sentences than yeah. diagrams usually. But I, I I will I will also say that like, you know, your 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 video is like eight, you you managed to boil all these things down to like 8 or 9 minutes. So it completely like removes the fact that there's hundreds of pages and searching and reading and all this other stuff that went wrong like it's it completely I mean, that's what youtube requires right absconds like, yes it completely absconds yeah. all of that <laughs> yeah in the, i think in the defcon talk i mentioned it and I'm, I'm still working on like a video on like the the full technical details and all of that stuff where i will maybe talk a bit about the the pain of implementing this but it was really it was really crazy like just like how many things just didn't work like you know at first open ocd had this thing where it wouldn't handle a certain um, SWD state correctly, or actually at all, it would just ignore it. Then the logic analyzer, you know, the thing that you trust <laughs> kind of kind of fails on you. And then you you are at this point where you, you wrote your own logic analyzer, you wrote your own SWD stack. And then it turns in the end out that a single bit was wrong, like just some reset. <laughs> yeah, like you could have just like, changed that. Oh, <laughs> Oof, that that hurt to be honest. <laughs> but I'm sure it was nice. Like I'm sure it's like oh, flip this bit and everything works. It's just like it's oh. like perseverance. Like <laughs> yeah, it's it's this moment where you're not sure if you want to throw it out of the window or just be happy. So I decided to be happy. Both. Happily, yeah, <laughs> yeah and, you can, and, it can be both. <laughs> And yeah, and for folks, uh, Open OCD is just an open source um, kind of JTAG, uh, JTAG, JTAG. Inter software interface, right? To talk to various hardware peripherals. Yeah. yeah. That was it. That one that that came out like what in the early two thousands. A I think? long time ago. Yeah, it's it's pretty old, and you can sometimes you know tell tell with the code, but basically, like all the steps that are involved is kind of like when you. When you have an iPhone and you want to get JTAG on it, first off, it has to be like an iPhone 7, 8, or X because it has to be vulnerable to this like checkmate exploit. Then you you have to jailbreak it. Um, then you have to demote it, which is you know just sets a certain register. And then you know then I I built this firmware for the Raspberry Pi Pico, which which talks Lightning, and so you like cut open a Lightning extension cable connected to your Pico, and then like as soon as you plug it plug in a Lightning cable into the iPhone, the iPhone is like hey what kind of cable are you? And then the cable can say, hey, I'm a USB cable, which will, you know, Lightning has like uh, eight pins, and then we'll set certain pins to be, you know, USB pins. Um, and and my cable just replies with, hey, please, I'm I'm this debug thing, please uh, talk JTAG to me. And then um, then you kind of talk this, this regular ARM JTAG protocol to the iPhone. This is like a, a side question, not related to any of the pins you've already mentioned. I'm really curious. Did you ever figure out which ones led out to like headphones at all? Oh, I actually, it's it's on my list for like okay. one of the next videos because okay. I, I have an adapter here that, that just failed on me. And so I, I will take a peek inside because some of them like authenticate as like, you know, if you buy the cheapest on Amazon, it will say, oh, I'm this Beats Pro headphones thing. It's <laughs> obviously not. It's not. True, not. So. <laughs> Yeah, and so so you have the lightning extension cable you cut, and then you have the the wires broken out. How did you sniff the ID bus, which is on the top of the cable? I assume. Yeah, so uh, I actually I just took so this this is a tip I got from I think Bendy Katos on on Discord. Like he told me, hey, get a lightning extension cable. It contains all signals, and so I just cut it apart, and then I attached my logic analyzer in the middle. Like I, it's re actually really nice, like the lightning extension has like all the cables in the same colors as regular jumper wires come. And so you can just perfectly map it onto jumper wires, just put it on a breadboard, connected my logic analyzer to it. Giant cable mess, signal integrity is nothing that I believe in. So <laughs> <laughs> oh, but I guess and that didn't affect this at all either. Yeah. I, guess I, I noticed that. <laughs> the extension cable doesn't have ID bus chip on it. Exactly. It's just completely oh. passive. And so I just plugged in an original lightning cable and then I could just sniff all the all the signals. And you could see like you can actually see 
um, so, so lightning is reversible, right? But it's yeah. actually, um, it's not symmetrical. Like the plug actually can, like the iPhone can, or actually the cable can tell which way around you plugged it into the iPhone kind of, or the iPhone but can tell. Basically, it, so like when you plug in, it's like doing kind of like a chirp and waiting for some yeah, response exactly. to figure out what orientation. Like, goes, I mean, okay, it's, a USB-C doing. does the same thing, yeah. right? You have your CC line and it knows uh, which way to mux everything. But I, but I thought that that one was symmetric, like. Uh, it, 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 it can be, but it doesn't. <laughs> but happen. yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't get me started on that. Yeah. <laughs> but yes, it can be, but. USB-C would make a great episode. The, the USB-C, the good parts and the bad parts to episodes. <laughs> I mean, yeah. you don't even need a reverse engineer to tell you about that. You just need like any electrical engineer yeah. to tell you about <laughs> Yeah. Well, but but I mean, everything's moving to C, right? Like th that's the rumor for the iPhones, hopefully in the future. But the iPads are already uh, USB-C now. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it's it's kind of like yeah, this chirp signal on the iPhone is just like it asks on on two pins, hey, are you there? Are you there? Are you there? Are you there via this one wire bus? And so, mm -hmm. it, yeah. I'd yeah. Be so curious. whichever side replies, you know which side it's on. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm I'm curious then. Let's say for you know once you've conquered the lightning cable, do you think you're going to go to USB C and try to see how it maps? I mean, now now I have to try it, right? So <laughs> are, are yeah, any of the sure. iPads uh, check rain um, compatible? Um, I I don't think for for like Checkmate, like none of the USB C ones, because I think it's only the the iPad Pros, like the the last two generations or so. Um, but I, you know, there's the rumors are on that basically Apple will still do some kind of authentication on USB-C peripherals and so on. And so, I mean, we'll we'll look at it. Um, and I mean, it's it's, a, to... it's another fun challenge, right? Yeah, exactly. But it's also just, you know, it, it's really cool to have this this just like even for modern iPhones, like with with like the firmware we built, you can actually reset them really quickly automatically. Like normally, if you want to go to like you know DFU mode or something, you have to hold button down for eight seconds and then remove one and then wait. And if you're not 100% precise, it doesn't work. And so with, with like Tamron, we can just, you know, hit a button and it will reset the iPhone. And so even for like the, for the non checkmatable devices, it has some value, which I think mm -hmm. is, is Oh, that's, I didn't cool. realize, oh, that's pretty cool. And okay, so you mentioned Tamron. So we haven't really talked about Tamron. Yeah, sure. yeah. except there's a monkey involved. Yeah, so what what is Tamron? Yeah, so so Tamarin is basically what we called uh, our our can see cable, so to say. So it's basically it's a firmware for the Raspberry Pi Pico. Um, it comes with with basically all the functionality of the DCSD cable, of the can see cable slash Bonobo cable. Um, and so you can put it on your Pico. You order this, you know, ten dollar Lightning extension cable. You just solder it onto your Pico, and that's it. And you're done. And you have like a full, you know, iPhone debugging setup, which is Pretty cool if you compare like fifteen dollars to I think the Bonobo cable retails for like seven hundred fifty or so. And you, you can actually get it. get it. Yeah, and you can't yeah. get it. And so yeah, that's that was that was fun. Also, we have this really amazing logo with this amazing monkey. So <laughs> <laughs> for yeah, free, and it, right? And and you have the I guess the files are on GitHub, right? For yes. folks who want to do it, mm -hmm. it's open source. It's like at github.com slash stack smashing slash tamarind firmware. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll have it. Do you, do you have the board files there as well? And um, actually, you don't need a board. You can, like you can just uh, oh, use just the, the regular Pico. Do a Pico. Yeah, like Lightning theoretically is at three volts, but you know, three point three volts is within tolerances hey. as far as we could test. Yeah. So. And and um, because yeah. on your I think the DEF CON talk, you made a custom uh, board for it as well. Yeah, which we are still like we are still doing some revisions on that because turns out like chip shortage made it yeah. really really difficult to get USB hubs, and so um, yeah, oh, shit. Um, there might be some some use on that soon. But basically, um, for all that matters, you don't need anything. You could you can just use a Pico, you know, solder on some wires, and that's it. Oh, the the hubs just to um, not just need for two cables. Comfort. Yeah, exactly. It's just to you know. Um, Basically, we, we can set the lightning port to have USB enabled, uh, serial, and JTAG at the same time. And so yeah. if you want to have USB over single plug and less you know, dangling wires, then, then the board will help you out. And we hopefully will do a production run eventually uh, this year. <laughs> cool. Um, yeah, no, I know. Yeah. And, 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 and at least I, you might be able to do it all with JLC um, PCB and, and have them build it. I, I, I did my little the cable tester. And I know they have Picos, uh, the RP2040s on, on there, and, and USB connectors. I don't know if they probably have hubs. 
Yeah, exactly. And that's that's kind of the goal. Um, as a like chip shortage, yeah, kind of got in the way. But uh, what's cool is that you you don't need it. You just need a Raspberry Pi Pico, which you can get mm -hmm. everywhere basically now. And so it's really yeah. um, we we hope to. Like by the way, this I did this all with with Carlo Maragno, uh, a good friend of mine, mm -hmm. uh, and so we we did a lot of the hardware work together and so on. So, um, just big shout out to him. So we are still working on the board there. Is he on uh, on the socials? Yeah, I will I will send you the. the will, okay, yeah, we'll, we we'll put him in the show him. notes. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, nice. and now now I know like universities are using it, and you know like. Ole is using it for Frida, and some other people mm -hmm. in the community are using it. So uh, that, that's, really, that's so nice really to hear. Cool to see. Yeah. No, no, it's, no, it's it, great to hear, right? It's awesome. It's they. I think everyone benefits, right? Because yeah. now, I mean, at least the iPhone, I think all of these iPhones are still getting the latest iOS, right? So, so. Uh, um, the 7 doesn't, but iPhone 8 and X, yeah, are still on 8 and iOS. X, yeah, yeah. yeah so. So, so people can still do, you know, security research um, in a way that couldn't be done before exactly. outside of Apple. And it's it's really cool because you can actually like dump the the um, like parts of the the secure ROM and so on. So it's it's really nice to get started with with all of this kind of stuff. And um, so just one last Open OCD question: w Open OCD does it send like SWD commands through, or does it have its own protocol that that you interpret in the Pico? Yes, yeah, so so it's relatively easy to add a custom adapter to to like Open OCD, and there's there's this project called Pico Pro, which turns the Raspberry Pi Pico into an SWD adapter, and so I kind of based it uh, around that code base, um, just did some changes, which in the end turned out to not be necessary, but you know, um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, just that that single bit was wrong. So so now we we have like the the custom Tamarind support in Open OCD, so we have an Open OCD fork basically. Um, and then for the Bonobo, so the the guys behind behind uh, the Bonobo cable, which I think is called uh, Lambda um, something, Lambda concept, I think. Yeah, Lambda yeah. concept. Um, and so they were nice enough to open source their OpenOC configuration files. And I just want to highlight like this, we would not be where we are with Tamarin without that open source, um, without that open source part, because that was just uh, amazing work by them. So, and we also didn't want to, you know, become competition in any way, which is why we are not doing this commercially. Yeah. This was just like, okay, these people can't get a cable. Let's build one. And then, so, so huge, huge, huge thanks to, to Lambda Concept. And, um, th okay, that, that, that's really cool. And, and then one last, uh, I, I already set one last question, but, but it reminded me of another one. When uh, you connect to the iPhone, and I saw your on, on your talk, there's multiple cores on there. Does yes. that magically get discovered by OpenOCD? No. So this is manually in the in these configuration files that Lambda Concept published. Um, we that that's what we are kind of uh, using. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Because because I was like, wait, there's like, how how do you know which which cores to enumerate and whatnot? And, and different iPhones have different processors, right? Yeah, exactly. And so, like, I I don't know enough about SWD. Well, maybe now I do, but at the point in time, <laughs> to to create these configurations, and so they even like did patches to Open OCD to make it compatible with like the ARM sixty four stuff on the iPhone. So, so just a huge, huge, huge shout out to to them. Without them, no way we could have done this. No, that that that's that's the beauty of open source. I'm kind of curious though. Have have we? Do we have any expectation that they're going to go with an M1 chip in the iPhone? I think they're already doing that. They're going to start doing that. The iPad iPads Pros Red. have M1 and yep. M2, I think. Yeah, but I'm just expecting it at some point. It's got to go on the iPhone, right? It's the same. I mean, it's just it's still more. Core. It's just more, <laughs> like more power, more, more uh, yeah. cores. But but I think it's based on the same architecture. Yeah, I'm I'm still rocking my iPhone XS, so I don't know I, anything about those those. Devices. I have an SE here with a with a fingerprint sensor. It's still nice. Oh my it's god, that's a when 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 was it on well, the back? Well, it's just the SE, uh, the second gen. I don't know. Oh. It's probably three four years old. That's what that's what I missed was the the fingerprint. Well, I didn't wasn't really good about using the fingerprint reader, but like yeah. I miss having that at least as an option. <laughs> buttons, physical buttons. So yeah. many buttons. Um, yeah, no, no uh, you just mentioned the chat, but we, we talked about, mentioned the Game Boy before. I also want to mention um, your N64 auto, like AI training videos. Oh, the yeah. Mario Kart. Oh, yeah, yeah, let's talk so about that. So much fun. So, so fun story. Like uh, after I had this this adapter, like basically I, I did this video where I, where I used a physical N64 
mm -hmm. I connected the video output to my computer and I, mm -hmm. I built like a virtual, like basically I turned a Pico into an N64 controller. And so yeah. I used TensorFlow on my computer mm -hmm. to, to learn to drive and uh, the actual N64 Mario Kart. Um, uh -huh. And so that was, that was a ton of fun. And then I, I actually, so I'm, I'm a cyclist basically. And so I actually, with this adapter, I hooked up my, my bike to my N64 so that I can actually ride Rainbow Road on my bike. So. <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I mean, I, I assume the N64 reversing community is huge. Like the, the, the everything's documented already. So you didn't have to yeah. do. It's no, that, no that's not ARM. <laughs> that's all MIPS. <laughs> But just just the interface for the controller, yeah. like yeah, is yeah. it said analog for the for the sticks or, or is no, it no, all... it was uh, uh, digital. I I think it was like spy like or something. Oh wow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So maybe we should go back and talk talk about the uh, the Game Boy stuff because yeah. that one's like particularly. I'm kind of curious about how we dumped the ROM also for that since the, he mentioned that earlier. So tell us about your Game Boy project. Tell the audience. Sure. Yeah. I, I guess I'm. I'm a fan of the Game Boy. For me, it's like the the original handheld. I like. I remember mm -hmm. playing it countless hours, and so I I really, I don't know. This is kind of where where it all started for me. Like the embedded, it's the first yeah. embedded handheld I had in my hands. So, so yeah, for me, um, I I really like exploring a lot of you know modern concepts on it. So for example, if you look at when you turn on the Game Boy, you know the boot logo scrolls down the screen. Yeah, and that's actually copy protection. Like it's basically uh, what what's happening is that there's a boot ROM in the Game Boy, and the boot ROM basically loads the logo from the cartridge. Yep. Displays it, scrolls it down the screen, and then it checks whether it's the original Nintendo logo. And so, and if it is, it continues booting the game. But if it isn't, so if you you know replace the, the logo with something else, then it would stop booting. And the idea. Oh, and the logo is uh, copyrighted. Or exactly. Or like the idea is that basically, if you wanted to, you know, make your your own game for the Game Boy, you would have to violate, you know, Nintendo's trademark. And so, um, but it turns out this this ha actually had a time of check to time of use bug. So basically, the logo got read from the cartridge first and displayed, mm -hmm. and then for the check, they read it again from the cartridge. And so, if you replaced, you know, the the mapping on the flash or so like you just even a capacitor that changes an address line on your on your eprom yeah. uh, would be enough you could actually show a custom logo but still pass the check without infringing on trademark which probably would have never you know worked in an actual court of law yeah so i did this with like uh, with like an fpj which is you know using 150 dollars of equipment to to bypass yeah. this this check um and then there are there are other cool things you can do on the game Boy. like for example you can actually do clock glitching on the Game Boy mm -hmm. by just scraping a certain pin on the board with like a jumper wire that's connected <laughs> to ground. And so you can just use that with a spe special cartridge to dump the boot ROM and so on. I feel so, like this yeah. is, yeah. I'm just kind of wondering, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, it's no. very, but it immediately comes to mind like, you know, um, circuit bending. Cause like all, cause all that, all that stuff was made kind of in that, that 80s, late 80s time period when you could just, attach a wire put a pot on something and you could see get what very... happens yeah just see yeah, what happens exactly. <laughs> yeah and so so i did some of that and then i um like during covid basically um mm -hmm. i i'm a big fan of game boy tetris i'm not particularly good unfortunately but i i really like it don't worry there's a movie coming out you know you <laughs> yeah to, you that's true watch the movie <laughs> yeah <okay. laughs> i don't I know, know if it's, it's going to be there in germany yeah. but on Apple TV in the United States, there will I be a movie not. called Tetris. <laughs> oh God, I hope not. Um, but yeah, so basically, um, and you can you can play Game Boy Tetris like with two player over the yeah. link cable between two Game Boys, and so, uh, and I had this idea of like bringing this online, like I wanted to play Game Boy over the internet, kind of. Mm -hmm. Oh, but and using then, a physical Game Boy. Yes, yes. Using a physical Game Boy, ah. a custom USB adapter connected to my computer. And and then I read online that it's impossible, and so obviously I I wanted to do it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> have to, hundred hours. So, yeah, exactly. So so it turns out that basically, um, it's a uh, it's spy basically the protocol for the link cable, mm -hmm. and the problem is that the data is sent at the the same time in both directions, uh. right? And because it's so basic, like there there's no way you can buffer it in in the middle, and so theoretically you would have to have like you know sub microsecond ping to to do this. Or you you know you you basically emulate the on the host side on the computer side the Game Boy and then emulate 
the Game Boy on the other side too. And so basically there's like an initiator and a and kind of a client in, yeah. in the Game Boy um Tetris thing. And so my my web USB website, which I've is the first thing I ever wrote in JavaScript really. <laughs> yeah. Um basically emulates the the Tetris server so to say uh, it basically plays the initiator and mm -hmm. then you can play tetris over the internet and now the original tetris only supports two player but with the way i build it i can i kind of uh, can do this with you know a hundred players and so you you can do like battle royale tetris uh, over the internet with the game boy with the yes. raspberry pi pico are you using web usb by any chance yeah i'm using web usb yeah. <laughs> oh so nice. it's like you, you plug because turns out like i was i was researching how you can do usb on like linux mac os and windows yeah. mm -hmm. and chrome you absolutely don't want to except if you use web usb but i yeah. really didn't want to javascript but uh, turns out there's no way around it basically Kit. So yeah i get web assembly maybe but yeah so let, let, me, let me interject really quickly because i don't know what the web usb is and maybe some people in the audience don't. What is Web USB? It's it's this very great idea of basically letting any website talk to USB devices, and okay. so it's absolutely there's no security implications at all in this. <laughs> but basically, yeah, nothing it's, bad it's... can happen. I love that you're giving us that reassurance. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, Thank absolutely. You no, no one would ever okay. abuse this. But it's basically no. it's it's really it's made kind of well. Like you you visit a website and they get a pop up and it's like, hey, do you want to? let this website connect to to your USB device and then is limited to to like certain uh, USB types and so on. Yeah. But yeah. I feel like I've experienced this, but that is something for us to discuss after we're done recording. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's and but it's it's cool because you can just, you know, visit like tetris.stacksmachine.net mm -hmm. and then you plug in the adapter. No drivers, no nothing. Yeah, and yeah. it just go. Um yeah, but it's that was that was interesting. I'm not really like a big web technology fan let's say but web usb is really amazing uh like yeah what's the largest game you've managed to have have happen simultaneously how many users? Um, mine was like seven but it's okay. like a public server and i've not checked how many people mm -hmm. are actually in there also like while I, I was shooting a video on this and i lost every single game which was really frustrating <laughs> <laughs> it's like no i'm good at this normally i promise <laughs> Yeah, I didn't. First of all, I first of all I didn't know that there was. Obviously, I haven't played tandem, uh, competitive Tetris. Tetris, but like I thought, you know, only playing the single person version. I thought every game you ultimately lost. <laughs> I don't. I never thought of the game as a game that you won. I don't think you can win Tetris. Yeah. Oh yeah, I don't think you so. can finish it on the Game Boy. On the Game Boy, really? Yeah, yeah. At the end, there's oh. like rockets shooting up and so on. So if you you can't finish, you can win uh, Tetris on the Game How Boy. How many and levels like is that? <laughs> It's it takes a while and it takes a lot of practice and you have uh -huh. to be you know it can get very frustrating if you're getting close and yes. then you know somebody interrupts you and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so so you you've beat Tetris on the Game Boy? Uh, to be honest, no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you well, for your there's honesty. YouTubers. There's YouTubers. You just live vicariously through them as they win, but like I've <laughs> I've I've reversed the ROM yeah. and I've seen the sprites that will be displayed ah, once you manage to win okay. it. But yeah. Okay. 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 <laughs> And, and and so for for Game Boy cartridges, does it actually do any processing on the cartridge itself? Is it just memory that runs on the main processor? What what's going on? Yes, yeah, so, so there are actually different Game Boy cartridges, and so for example, like Tetris is probably the simplest one. It's just an EEPROM or actually a, a PROM on on a PCB. That's it. But then there are others that have like, um, it's called MBC, memory bank controllers, where you have mm -hmm. RAM in the cartridge or you have an RTC in the cartridge. There are even like, there's, for example, um, Pokemon Pinball, I think, which has like a rumble motor in, mm -hmm. in yeah. the cartridge and so on. And there's the Game Boy camera. And so you can do processing on the, on the cartridge. Um, mm -hmm. And there are some really cool projects around that. But yeah, Tetris is like the simplest way to go. But, but it's still it all through... Reasonable. It's still just memory access, right? Like the yeah. if you're doing processing, you're just making fun registers and then doing stuff, and then the Game Boy just reads and writes memory. Yeah, yeah. So it, it sounds to me a, a lot like what the Nintendo cartridge, like normal Nintendo cartridges, are like the early ones. I can't speak to anything that they have now, but yeah, yeah, similar ROM. Just no dumping. CIC, like on yeah. on the Super Nintendo, you had like this this CIC chip mm -hmm. for authenticity. None of that on the Game Boy. Just is just there the is there logo. are they reusing the app header 
like I know that there's like the kind logo? of like a, a a game vendor like uh like details that they wanted to know and if you didn't if you weren't on the list like it, your game wouldn't work or something like there's, that there's there's a header but there's yeah. it's not checked against anything so it's it's used like on okay. the super nintendo when you have this, yeah. this game boy adapter but otherwise there's nothing nothing in there and in your in your early game boy reversing days did you ever play with the game shark oh I yeah no i i've i have not but actually like one of the i think it was action replay uh developers reached out to me so that was cool but uh yeah, oh, nice. I've not actually used uh, any of that. Did, do you know how it worked? Because I know I, I had one and I had no I was idea. I say to you use cheater. <laughs> well, you you would put I, it between the cartridge yeah. and the Game Boy. Mm -hmm. My my understanding is that it kind of intercepted certain memory reads, basically, or or even writes. I don't know. Um, and so that's my understanding. Like you basically, when you entered a cheat code, it would patch certain things yeah. in the cartridge memory. Yeah, like mm. you could uh, don't decrement my lives, you know, or yeah, give exactly, me infinite yeah. speed or yeah, I never I never figure out how to use it because I was a kid, you know, I was like 12 or 13 and I was like, oh, I'm going to play whatever. Um, was it not very use? Was it not easy to use? I know it was not user one. friendly. No, okay. like it would boot. It would have kind of a thing. And, and there was the mode where you would go online and. Oh, like, oh, uh -huh. for Pokemon, if you mo modify these, uh -huh. like this memory address said this and I had no uh -huh. idea what it was doing. Then you get that, and then they had the other mode where you would actually monitor memory as you're playing, and so you start losing lives, and then you start with the game shark, you start looking for memory addresses decrementing or like oh, value, shit. and then you're like, oh, that's where it is. That's cool. What an one. incredibly <laughs> not user friendly product that I thought sold lots. <laughs> By the way, well, I'm sure I'm sure they had like uh, most people didn't care how it worked. There's like, oh, I just put this number here, this number here, and then I'm I'm done. I... Or maybe it had maybe it had pre maybe it had preloaded for certain yeah. games. I, don't I know. would think that would be preloaded for popular games. Yeah. But yeah, I never I never we we That's weren't allowed to have that. Right. We're never allowed to have that. Sorry. <laughs> I don't know so when I got it. <laughs> Probably yeah. Um, I, I should ask my brother if he still has it because uh, he 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 kept my. I had a Game Boy Advance that I modified with a with a, a, uh -huh. a backlight and rechargeable batteries. And... Wow, wow! You yeah, really Game tricked Boys, that out. Like, <laughs> they've gotten expensive. Like you could get the Game Boys a couple of years ago for like you know ten to twenty dollars, and now they're like easily a hundred bucks if you're unlucky. Yeah, because you know people are using them again. Yep, it's great. <laughs> it still works. That's the beauty of it, right? Yeah, and it's it's fun. Like some of the games are, are really good. I, I honestly I, I probably spent more time like fiddling around with random stuff than actually playing games in the past years. But yeah. I think it's it's nice if you can explore something like clock glitching on the Game Boy and you you know, you look like like for me, uh I grew up with the Game Boy. It was the thing that I, I was interested in and we Yeah. Like with a friend of mine, Life Overflow, we we also reverse engineered some of the the Pokemon glitches and so on that we we used in our childhood. So the missing kind of now, fun. yeah, missing <laughs> now, and also the Mew uh, glitch and so on. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, I, well, it's, it's, oh, I you bring up memories because yeah, the missing now you could clone items, right? Yeah, um, exactly. And but I remember the link cable one for getting Mew and for cloning Pokemon, and I had no idea. Yeah. I mean, it's it's like using exploits as a as a kid without knowing you're actually doing like race conditions right or, or yeah uh, it's like, like okay we gotta thing, unplug yeah. the link cable real quick in the middle of the transfer well for me that that's that was so 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 interesting about tom's uh uh answer about how we got into reverse engineering because like usually it's we always hear video games but he didn't say video games he said like game hardware boy. yeah hardware <laughs> game boy <laughs> yeah he was so specific <laughs> I don't know. I, I learned to solder relatively young, and so it's been linking Safe, ABs you, ever since. <laughs> so was, was that like one of your parents that taught you to do soldering, or you just like, look, yes, I'm going to buy this somewhat. dangerous thing? and <laughs> They, they bought the dangerous thing, essentially. Oh, cool, cool. <laughs> and then I, I, I burned my fingers until it worked. <laughs> Were you like choking I... up on the, the, <laughs> the thing to get like a pencil? <laughs> Just wondering why you have no more fingerprints. <laughs> <laughs> no, you should burn the side of my hands instead. But how do you burn the side of your hand, man? <laughs> On the stand, like just oh, like, yeah, my yeah. hand, and it's like oh, oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I I picked one up as a kid when my dad was soldering, and I learned that lesson real quick, uh, and then the rest have been accidental. 
Yeah, I just saw my my father using it, and then eventually <laughs> I I had access to one, and I just you know poked at it with solder until something sticked. So <laughs> yeah, yes, that really is. I mean, that's pretty accurate for most people. The first time I do it until something stuck, and then yeah. <laughs> good or bad, you don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, All right, well, let's move on to our, our, our recurring questions to everyone in, in our. Yeah, we don't know, have that many at this point. We got to work no, on but, this. No, but you know, we, we have the, the tools question. So, what, what is your favorite tool? That's a good question. So, I'm going to say software, it's going to be Ghidra. Like, mm -hmm. my, nice. I guess my, my, my YouTube channel and so on started as like mm -hmm. a Ghidra channel, kind of. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. So. I think Ghidra has, has changed reverse engineering and the accessibility of reverse engineering. Like, no need to totally legally license ida pro as a 14 year old which is really for good. for thousands of dollars exactly, right as we all did um, yes. and yeah. so i think that's that's really good i love the the decompiler centric yeah, yeah. approach i love yeah. that it supports arm and everything i mm -hmm. um it's not it's not great it's just like it's, it's not great in usability it's not bug free whatever but it i think it really changed the game and yeah and there's undo i believe Exactly, and <laughs> you know, Ida now has it too. So, so if if Ghidra has Everyone done one benefits. thing, it, wait, 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 my sticker that I have with, that says "No Undo," no surrender. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so that's and then on on the hardware side, I don't even know. Probably like any oscilloscope is just always fun to play with. So. Yeah. What are you running Ghidra on? Are you just running on a, a virtual machine on on Linux or something else? I'm running it. We run it straight, Jen. On, Whatever. Yeah, straight on. Yeah. on Where you're like, we're over that, Jen. I'm like, I have so many machines. <laughs> yeah. Like, I'm just like, I. It'd just be easier if I could just not have. I'm, installed I'm just hoping for the best. But now that I've said that publicly, I probably should start using a VM. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I thought you were gonna say the RP2040 for for your favorite tool. That was true, so true, true. It. That's a good point. Actually, you're right. Like RP24, probably by now my favorite tool. Which because is kind you of use weird. it for everything, yeah. Yeah, it, it's kind of weird because when I when I first read about the RP twenty forty, I was like, mm -hmm. why? I I didn't get it at all. Like we have STM thirty two, right? Like what do we need RP twenty yeah. four uh, for? Because of my dev board addiction, I still bought one, obviously, and then I started <laughs> playing it, and so I uh, I don't know. I I love it. I love PIO. It has the best documentation of any chip. It has an open source boot ROM and so on. I. I just really, really enjoy the Raspberry Pi Pico. And so now it's gotten like kind of this this meme that whenever I hack something, it has to be with the RP2040. And then Colin like actually built like the 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 chip shouter, um, the smaller one, the Pico EMP around the, the Raspberry Pi Pico. And I think he he partially credited me with that. So that's <laughs> awesome. I, I love it. Okay. I, I, like I, now, now good. I'm now I'm on my phone, like going, okay, let me go to Amazon. Let me get. Let yeah, me you can get them on DigiKey Mouse, or like you can. And if not, I have a yeah. few, Jen. Uh, maybe maybe we I need to you, meet up. <laughs> swap me swap. I've seen you once in the past three years, I think. No, no, I, no, no, no. I don't. Twice, like twice, twice. There was at, we yes. we bumped bikes. <laughs> yes. At, at DEF CON, somebody actually wanted uh, me to autograph their, their Raspberry Pi Pico, oh, which was funny. Awesome. So. <laughs> you need like yeah. the silver Sharpies for those, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that, 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 that's how you know you've made it. It's like, all right, people want me to autograph RP2040. <laughs> that's what I mean, it's a, it's a two pack. It's a two pack on Amazon. I get them on reels for yeah, 1450 you can get on a reel. You can yes. even wear it like, you know, an ammunition belt. <laughs> a carabiner? <laughs> that, oh, that would be great. <laughs> RP2040 carabiner is like that'd be a good DEFCON like costume you <laughs> just just walk around well I mean I have like those you know like for the dongles for you know for particularly for iPod or not iPod oh my god iPad like I have all those dongles that go from to for your headphones and I just have yeah. a little dongle jack that I can plug that onto so it hangs on my keychain and like just make one one of those with the USB on the other side and pfft. That would be yeah, I had a reel of them on my thing. desk. I can't find them anymore, but I was trying to pick them up. Awesome. That's a, a yeah. This this has been this has been so much fun. I, I've been uh, wanting to talk about all this stuff for a while. <laughs> that is very much like you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've been I've been, I've been following you. I, I know for um, back when you did the AirTag stuff, it was also when Twitter Spaces got popular. Oh yeah. 
Mm-hmm. And are y'all are y'all still doing the Twitter Spaces uh, hangouts every yeah. once in a while? We used to do it on on Clubhouse initially, and then we did it on Twitter, and it was a, a ton of fun. But eventually, it kind of died down, and and so maybe we'll we'll do another one eventually. But yeah, um, we used to have this this kind of we called it reverse engineering adventures, just like a Twitter space where people could talk about anything reversing, and it was we had some some awesome conversations there. So it was really good. Yeah, no, I know. It was, it was in the middle of the day for us, so I hopped in a couple of times, but it was it was a lot of fun. I know we asked you what your favorite tool is, and we're we're running short on time. Okay, favorite tool done, but now let's switch it up. If you were stranded on a desert island, what tools would you bring with you? Obviously, and do not use Chat GDP <laughs> or GPT. <laughs> no, I don't need to. Obviously, a Raspberry Pi Pico. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and how many? There's a tool belt of them. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. just get a real rhythm, like you know, Rambo style. <laughs> you can tie things with it if you have a big enough reel. Yeah. You can use it as a rope. <laughs> it then, provides yeah. shade on a on a sunny day. Exactly. Then obviously Game Boy with Tetris. So probably yeah, stranded on a desert island. I that might give me the opportunity to actually beat Tetris. Oh, so. yes. oh my god. Just need You're a like, finally, time to focus. <laughs> <laughs> no one has mentioned that before. Okay, what, but what about your water purification needs? Like <laughs> Tetris first. Tetris yeah, first. exactly. We'll, we'll, we'll figure that out after we've bet yeah, Tetris. Yeah, yeah. And yes. otherwise, is there any reason okay. to, you know? <laughs> to live, yes. <laughs> okay, okay. Final question. As you know, the year is 2023, and it's been very disappointing. I mean, in some ways, it's really living up to things like, you know, pandemic. Chaos. Oh, my God. Uh, we can't tell the difference. Like, people are making, like, uh, AI-generated photographs of, of political figures. Uh, the weather is out of control. Is this the future you were hoping for? <laughs> uh, I don't think so, but to be honest, I'm still enjoying it, so... I'll, That's I'll just try to to look at the at the sunny side of things. You just gotta lean like back, it. yeah. Enjoy, you know, like take, you know, enjoy the ride. You know, just blind, get away from everything. Take your Game Boy and have some fun. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know if those islands are gonna be around for you to like sit on. Don't be my ones. That's hard, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, given that, does that mean that what you're looking to looking forward to doing more of is more raspberry pieing, more game boying. What what glitching. are you looking for? Yeah. More glitching. To be honest, I'm I'm kind of like I think I've I've done everything that I wanted to do with the Game Boy for myself. Like yeah. you know, I've, and so I don't know. I'm kind of looking for, for the next thing to to look at. Right. Yeah. Like I feel like over the last year there wasn't really a lot of interesting targets to actually yeah. Hack and so if anyone has suggestions, please send me a message. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna <laughs> say. Like, yeah, let's get that going. Uh, uh, Twitter DMs are open for uh, for nerd sniping. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like if, he's if very susceptible. Me, if you send me a random flash dump of an interesting device, it's very yeah. likely that you will manage to nerd snipe me. So um, yeah, but but basically, I, I don't know. I'm I'm really hoping for some interesting targets, like yeah. just some interesting research opportunities again, because yeah, it feels yeah. like you know. There hasn't been any new interesting microcontrollers, no, no new devices that are particularly interesting to me, or maybe I've I've just you know missed mm-hmm. it. So hopefully we'll we'll find some some cool targets. But otherwise, um, yeah, hope hope to see more more glitching uh, that people do. Okay, and the absolute last part of that that future question, and maybe you don't have advice for yourself because it sounds like you've done like a lot of everything kind of like that you've wanted to do to some sense to some degree everything's really worked out would you give yourself any advice like 20 years ago oh that's a tough one i mean Um, maybe you're 20 so maybe that advice (laughs) uh, (laughs) eat your breakfast (laughs) get get lots of sleep (laughs) younger self i think one of the things a lot of people in it security tend to forget is you know sports like never stop with that part i think that will be a big one like i I think staying healthy is something that that would be super important to to a lot of people, and that's definitely an advice I would give to myself. I mm-hmm. I've gotten back into it, and it's definitely tough. So just 
never get out of it so that, yeah. that really helps yeah. stay healthy yeah exactly stay healthy and then you know i don't know um just enjoy the ride basically i think like yeah don't don't overthink everything and just enjoy the ride i like it yeah yeah i do think that that's very under yeah underrepresented in our community just yeah. just have fun enjoy the ride you, so what you're saying is like don't don't you know take a break from your project <laughs> maybe you underestimated wildly go for a bike ride <laughs> between clear your brain reversing. <laughs> yeah yeah i don't sweet. know it sounds, it sounds like if it sounds to be a little bit like maybe like in the future when someone asks you how long is it going to take quadruple your estimate there's this great <laughs> this great guy who's like you know um f word powerpoint there's no power in these points and i think that's <laughs> that's really like that's probably very accurate that's on point so yeah that's awesome, awesome. well it's it's been a, it's been such a fun uh hour uh chatting with you uh, where can people find you online uh, if if <laughs> if you want to find you <laughs> Yeah, I'm I'm on Twitter uh, at at Ghidra Ninja, which was my original YouTube name, which you know I I got by inserting Ghidra into a domain search and suggested yeah. dot Ninja. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm I'm on Twitter at Ghidra Ninja on YouTube at Stack Smashing. Otherwise, StackSmashing.net. I mm -hmm. I receive good old email. Um, if I don't answer at first, try again. I get a lot of DMs. <laughs> <laughs> So it sounds like yeah. DM is mostly what you're looking at, not necessarily email. Uh, whatever. Both okay, works. whatever. Okay. Both works similarly yeah. not so well. Similarly <laughs> well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Be persistent is what I'm hearing. Um, shall we do, shall we wrap it up? Let's do it. Okay, Alvaro. If you want to be found, where can people find you? I don't. Leave me alone. Uh, no, I am on Twitter at Alvaro Prieto, on uh, Mastodon at Alvaro, I think, at Mastodon Social, alvaroP.com, social spots. But yeah, I, on, yeah. yeah, I don't uh, even know where I am. I'm also on Mastodon, by the way, like infosec.exchange. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yes. I forgot and about so that. are we. We have yeah. a yes. podcast of Mastodon. So, okay. So, uh, yes. And I think that infosec is that's also where i am still at rebel bot gen and i think that's also where unnamed is uh, yeah so unnamed Ari. yep or unnamed, unnamed show Ari. yeah I unnamed don't show remember. <laughs> oh, no. it's in the show notes <laughs> it's in the show don't notes worry. but if for some reason you're not on mastodon you're not on twitter even though we c i don't know about you alvaro i have been still checking twitter oh so, yeah, yeah i still yeah. check it yeah it's there's people there. I'm yeah, still yeah, gonna yeah. check it. Yeah, yeah. I'll be honest with you. Mastodon for me is like more sane conversations and then a lot of cats on my timeline. That's most of what I see. And I'm that's sure what that's what you enjoy, you know? That's yeah, yeah. I subscribe. Yeah. For. Yeah. Yes. I subscribe to cats of Mastodon and it like seriously, it's just all cats all the time. <laughs> Shocking. Um let's see. Uh if you have comments things you want to talk about guests you want to bring in want us to talk to you whatever uh you can find us on twitter or or mastodon as we just mentioned or there's a comment form where we'll completely ignore it and maybe look at it two years later if you still can't find us uh, go to unnamedre.com and you can download um all of our podcasts look at the show notes which we try to keep up nicely we want to say thank you to all of our patreon supporters um there's a very long list if you want to join that, if you want to become one of those Patreon supporters, talk to us on our own Discord, get stickers, whatever. Uh, we have a link on both uh, on all of our social media to um, join up and uh, talk to us on the regular. Uh, we're still looking for reviews for the show. You know, <laughs> maybe maybe you have opinions about the frequency of how often we do the show. I don't know. You can complain all you want on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify whatever the hell Google's doing now, uh, whatever the hell Amazon's doing now, go there, complain. We'll eventually find out about it. I think that's All it. Right. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me.